today I'm excited to have one of the much loved Australian television sports presenters on the show. Beginning her career initially on radio in Perth, she was quickly snapped up by Channel 7 before forging a successful career hosting international cricket, AFL footy on Fox Sports, and most recently as this year covering the Australian Open tennis for Channel 9 and the most watched sporting event in the world, the NFL Super Bowl in Miami for ESPN. Please welcome the amazing Narrowly Meadows. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Niz. Thanks for jumping on. I'm probably a little bit nervous with you because you're one of those presenters, reporters, journalists. I don't go too hard on me in all these questions <laughs> today. <laughs> Oh, I hope I hope I don't make people nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm feeling the pinch, so uh, no, nah, all good. Well, well, Nest, why don't we start with how, how did your journey begin in the sports media industry? Can you can you sort of take us back to the start and let us know how it all started for you? Yeah, I um I grew up in a country town in um, Western Australia called Collie, a little coal mining town. So sport was always massive there, as it is in any Australian country town. Um, the entire community really revolved around the two footy teams and yeah. um, the netball club and there was a, a big soccer presence there as well because we, you know, had a lot of um, Italian families down there. So um, sport was always enormous to me. Um, I was really lucky that I had female role models in my life that always loved sport as well. My, both of my grandmothers um, were mad for it. And uh, yeah. Nana in particular would always talk to me about the Invincibles and, and West Coast and all those sorts yeah. of things. Um, <laughs> loved Booney. Um, and yeah. And my mum was the same um, and she, she says that she would often watch waffle um, footy when, you know, when I was a baby and, and yeah. those sort of things. So I think for me, being a woman and loving sport was always sort of encouraged and, um, and normalised, I guess, as it should yeah. be. Um, but I also had two big brothers and would play with them all the time. And so, yeah, just loved sport growing up. Um, and I was about 14 when I realised I was too short, too slow and not particularly talented. <laughs> so I decided to watch it for a living instead. Yeah. All right. You're getting bashed up by the bigger brothers. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I remember we had one uh, when, when I was 12 years old, we went to the US and we found an outdoor skating rink and no one was on it. So we um, had a, a game of ice hockey, um, just the three of us. And I've oh, never yeah. been so bruised in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine playing ice hockey is hard enough, let alone trying to <laughs> skate on ice, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I can imagine. So, um, yeah, and like, like you said, like all Australians, we just grew up loving sport, didn't we? So I suppose from there, knowing that you didn't want to become a, well, you know, didn't really want to be a sports person, I suppose, in that industry, but like you moved to, towards it in a, in a journalist sort of sense didn't you how, how did you become involved in the media side of things Ned? yeah so when I worked out that that's what I wanted to be at about 14 um I sort of sat down with mum and um and we looked at all the journalism courses that were around and at that stage um there were no sports specific courses I'm, you know I'm pretty sure there are now um so yeah. I sort of did a, a journalism course at, at Curtin and then tried to skew it as much as possible towards sport um, even though I had quite a few people tell me not to. Um, but I was like, I don't want to be a journalist. I want to be a sports journalist. So yeah. If, it probably you know, wasn't that popular back then, was it? You know, the sport journalists. I think, you know, they were pretty clear on um, there was only a handful of, um, you know, people that would end up with those sort of roles. And certainly being a woman was not, was less likely to be one of them. Yeah. Um, and, and it was sort of made pretty clear to me, but my approach to things was always, this is my dream. This is what I'm going to aim for. And if I don't get there, then something else will come up along the way. Yeah. Um, sort of, you know, back to myself in, I guess that I was smart enough yeah. and adaptable enough that if, if what I wanted to do didn't come about, then, then I'd be okay doing something else. Yeah. Um, that's a great and, mindset. Yeah. So, so have yeah. you already sort of already, or always carry that sort of positive mindset, Nez? Like, you, you know, with such a small amount of sort of sports journalists getting through, and particularly, as you just mentioned, female, um, knowing that it'll still, it would all work out okay in the end? I think, you know, I've got parents who uh, always believed in me and, um, and certainly encouraged us kids to, you know, as corny as it sounds, follow our dreams kind yeah. of thing because... <laughs> 
you know, my, my two brothers, one of them played hockey for Australia and the other one's an actor. So between the three of us, we didn't exactly pick the most stable <laughs> profession. Yeah, no. um, the oldest one ended up going from hockey to being a teacher, which is a much more um, admirable uh, <laughs> profession. <laughs> but, yeah, they, they sort of always just quietly believed in us. They were never, mm. you know, the loud parents on the sidelines or anything like that, but they yeah. just instilled a belief and... Particularly, um, you know, my dad is particularly quiet and so we just sort of quietly let us go about our business and obviously, you know, in a lot of people's lives, the, the approval of your parents, but particularly your dad is, um, is definitely um, one of those high rank sort of things that you're yeah. trying to achieve. And I remember when I, uh, when I quit my job at Channel 7 in Perth because I wanted to give it a crack on the East Coast and I thought maybe I might be a bit, um, crazy sort of leaving a really good job in a, in a um, major city in, a, in Australia mm. covering sport. And, but I just wanted to give it a go, that same mindset, you know, that I may as well go, go for the top and then achieve something else along the way if it doesn't work out. And I remember Dad sort of pulling me aside at the airport um, when I was flying out to, to move to Sydney and because um, and he's super quiet, you know, he doesn't okay. say a lot about anything and he, he just sort of pulled me aside and said, I'm, I'm really proud of you. I think you're doing the right thing. And we both started crying. And, yeah. you know, I'm getting so a little tingles sort of, there now. <laughs> <laughs> so I think dad sort of, you know, along the way, quietly picks his moments where generally speaking, he just allows me to make the decisions that I make along the way. But every now and again, I think when he senses that I might be feeling a little vulnerable about my own decision-making processes, sort of just quietly will be like, think you're doing the right thing yeah. <laughs> yeah that's great support Naz. and and I, I sort of i can relate that as well with with my family dad's the quiet one as well and I would always it's when he whenever he speaks you sort of you do li- listen in terms of his advice so yeah that's that's a great insight um Naz, as i sort of mentioned off the top you've you've had such a distinguished career and and you know from international cricket the AFL footy side, Super Bowl in Miami. Um, did you ever believe that this young girl from, from Western Australia would, um, would be doing or living the life that you're living? It's funny because I don't, I think when you're living something, it doesn't feel anything special. If that makes, I'm not trying to sound ungrateful, but it becomes normalised along the way. Yep. And, and I think the moment that you the moment that you think you're special is the moment that you, you know, you need to pull your head in really. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I, I, I'm think, you know, I'm really lucky. I've worked really, really hard, but Mm. it's not like one of those things that all of a sudden you wake up and you're at the Super Bowl. Or I think there are moments where you definitely go, um, huh, if you had told me when, you know, I was 14 or whatever, that this had happened. And I think it's pretty cool, but it's such an incremental Um, build over your career to get to those sort of places it takes so much time and effort and relationships and missing Christmases and Easter's and weekends and all of those sorts of things that I think when you achieve them it's unbelievable and don't get me wrong I I sort of often say to people I'm working with I'm the person that's here to remind you how lucky you are because I get so (laughs) excited about things um so when, you know, commentators are a bit jaded or whatever because, you know, they're former players and they've, they've been there, done that, and it's their 10th Boxing Day test or whatever, I'm, I'm sort of still that giddy kid that's yeah. really just the sports fan at heart. So I definitely feel lucky and special in, um, you know, having those special sort of experiences. Um, mm. And some days I do go, I, I live a weird, you know, life and a, yeah. a full life, but I definitely don't... Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's like changes who you are or anything like that. No, no. Has there been a highlight for you though, Ness? There's been so many. I mean, the the two two of the cricket World Cups that I've covered definitely stand out. In 2015, uh, covering the men winning on on home soil. Um, I got to cover that both in Australia and in New Zealand, and um, you know that was such a special experience. And it was after such a long summer and. Um, you know, we lost Hughesy that Phil Hughes that summer. Yeah. Um, and it, so I think I, it will never cease to amaze me just how those boys coped and the emotion involved in it. And I don't, I don't think as a country, we really, I think we've, you know, one day cricket has sort of diminished a little bit across our lifetimes. Mm. And I don't think we really quite understand how special that particular 
World Cup win was, given all the circumstances. Um, and then the, the other, you know, World Cup that I'm referring to is this year's Women's World Cup. Um, I, I never, you know, you talk about you never thought a girl from Collie WA would be on the MCG with 86,000 fans there to watch a female sporting event. Um, yeah. And I get goosebumps every time I talk about it. But I will, I'll never forget sort of, um, you know, walking across the MCG with Elisa Healy after she's, you know, you know match, match winning innings and, um, you know, and just the two of us who had ended up knowing each other for quite a bit of time and, um, you know, and I've worked a lot with her husband, Mitch, and just yeah. walking across the MCG and we're sort of both just gazing off you know, looking up into the crowd as we do the interview. And yeah. I mean, that's just special, that is. So I definitely think those couple of things. But I mean, just achieving the goal of um, being on the boundary for AFL was always massive for me. Um, yeah. You know, Super Bowl, obviously. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a heap. But um, for those two emotional reasons, I would definitely say that, that they're up the top. It's good we were, that you were able to do that in the middle of the MCG and actually look up and try and soak it all in because it's so often that you're in the moment and you're just you're trying to get it right or whatever. But it was great that both of you got, girls were able to look up and think, gee, how good is this? Yeah. And I mean, it's, I would like to think I've always been pretty good at that, at, at, at being grateful and, and recognising the moment of, of things and taking it in. I think it's really important. And um, I got to interview Billie Jean King that day and um, wow. and <laughs> that was also pretty cool because it was just after the presentation and she was really, you know, inspired and, and um, upbeat about the whole event. And then uh, at the end I was just sort of uh, summarising the interview and just, uh, you know, because obviously she, she doesn't have a great understanding of cricket per se, yeah. um, but she sort of said, oh, well, I summed up, summed up the interview and just said, oh, you know, considering it's, we call it the gentleman's game, I think this is a pretty special day. And she goes, oh, the gentleman's game, it's the women's game now. And I went, that's pretty cool. That's cool <laughs> that, is, that is so cool. Yeah, that's so awesome. <laughs> hey, hey, there's your, and you started your own podcast earlier this year as well, Ordinarily Speaking. And um, I've listened to most of the episodes. You've had some amazing guests. And some incredible stories, some real insights. Um, most, I actually went back to the start yesterday and listened to the Adam Trelaw one. Like, what inspired you to do that, Nez? Was there um, anything that you wanted to sort of um, reach out to the public and get these untold stories told? Or what was the main inspiration behind that? I think like 15 years in sports broadcasting, I, I often get a bit frustrated by the sort of negativity around it. Um, I think, as I sort of touched on, I got into sport because I love sport um, and I'm not good enough to play it, but I've always loved the stories, the emotional connection, the fact that in Australia it's so much about family and friends and camaraderie and mateship and um, and and that has never been lost on me. And I think as you delve deeper into a career of journalism, it felt like it was just getting more and more negative. And I totally understand the, you know, the need to, um, you know, expose lies or keep people, you know, genuine and, um, you know, and there's a, it is a business and there are a lot of fans that want accountability for their teams and with social media, you know, they've got their own platform to ask questions and all that sort of stuff. So, I understand the need for it, but I also think there is a need for human relatable stories um, for reminding people, yeah, that they, these these athletes are, at the end of the day, just humans who happen to be pretty good at sport. They're not criminals. They're not politicians. Um, you know, holding them accountable for their performances needs to be understood that that is still within the context of the sporting arena, not Parliament House, not jail, Um not the court system uh and and that has always been really important to me and as i i often say in, in many ways it makes me a pretty crap journo because a lot of the times i sort of shy away from you know stories or whatever but i just think there's room for all different types of journos so yeah that was my motivation i wanted to you know i've always really throughout my whole career been interested in those kind of stories um what really makes people tick celebrating their achievements and not just yeah. um holding them accountable for their their failings and and the other thing that i think people need to understand is that when you are somebody who is ambitious no one is going to be more critical of you than you are of yourself 
And that's what really comes across in all these interviews, particularly the Eamon Sullivan one who, you know, he's an Olympic swimmer who talks about not winning gold and the fact that he saw silver as a failure and still all these years on, 12 years on from, from the games that he's talking about, still has nightmares about it, still feels like he let his family, his nation down. Um, whereas most of us have even, you know, a lot of people have even forgotten the race was even run, you know. Um, mm. and, and so for me, yeah, I think that's really important. But, but the lay on, you know, this, the second effect of that or a result of that is not only do these athletes find it cathartic, but they're motivated by wanting to help other people. So mm. because sport is, um, does have this beautiful ability to invoke social change and inclusivity, um, these guys are motivated by wanting to help other people. So you mentioned Adam Chalor. He, you know, came from um, a difficult socioeconomic background and he feels like if he shares his honest story now instead of trying to be, you know, um, this idea of perfection, then kids who are also in that background have an attainable, you know, goal or somebody to look to that they can go, he did it, why can't I? Similar with Sabrina Duffy, um, AFLW, Freo Docker player, Yep. brought up in foster care, parents in and out of um, her biological parents in and out of jail with, um, with drug addiction. And yet she's achieved what she wanted to achieve. Like for a kid in care, how inspirational would that oh, be? It's so inspiring there. And I think that's what really got me with your episodes as well. And you touched on it, the human side of it. And, you know, media, um, as you say, can so easily default to all the negatives and you know yeah. I'm not what, trying to bash my colleagues or anything like that I just uh, want to you know a bit of balance or whatever. yeah absolutely and I think that's really um it's almost an Aussie way isn't it really like what we 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 want to watch the negative stuff but we we love hearing a good story we love the positive side the human side and as you say like I think those messages that you're getting out through your podcast where you know it's helping people you know it's helping inspire them they actually can achieve something or can do something with their life despite their you know how they've been brought up or all the circumstances that they're surrounded by yeah I think as I say setbacks breed empathy and vulnerability breeds strength geez that's a good one I like that thanks yeah. um I think a lot of people think that to be vulnerable is a weakness and I I have found particularly as a woman, a lot of the time you have to put forth this strong sort of front. And in the last few years, I've realised actually it's much more powerful to be honest with people, um, particularly other women in the industry because um, mm. you're so often pitted up against each other, either directly or indirectly. And so I've found, you know, I've tried to make a real effort in, in saying to people, oh, this is what I struggled with or, I, you know, and then they, they feel safe to open up. Yeah. Um, so if you are vulnerable with someone, they're more inclined to, to do the same back. And that's what generates a real conversation. I think, you know, during this pandemic, that's been one of the good things is that people have been um, more comfortable being vulnerable because they know that everyone is, is feeling on some level the same yeah. thing. Yeah, no, exactly. And you sort of just touched on it then in terms of the... The, 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 I mean, it's, it's really a male dominated industry, isn't it? The sporting industry. And, and, and there are those, there are a lot of females like yourself in it. How, how hard or difficult was it for yourself to have that voice or like um, get that respect from your peers or those players who, who, who you have interviewed before? I think um, they, they realized pretty quickly and um, that, you know, I mean, they kind of assume you know nothing until you prove you know everything. But once yeah. you've proven that, you're pretty good. Yeah. Um, so I, and but to be honest, I think most journos should take that approach. Um, yeah. So I definitely, I definitely think it's challenging. But now I, I realise that um, unfortunately I'm older than I think bar three football players left. I think it's Burgoyne, Ablett and Ma uh, Mundy. Oh, that's only... you and me both then. <laughs> <laughs> I think of the only three, three left. So please keep going, David Mundy. Um, <laughs> and so the players that are coming through now um, in this weird way, sort of, I was there first. So that, yeah. you know, I remember um, hosting the draft a couple of years ago when it was Sammy Walsh and he got up on stage and he went, oh, I know really. And we'd never met before. And, and I kind of was like, oh, this is weird. The number one draft pick knows me before I know who he is. Which I'm not saying that's across the board, but it was one of those penny drop moments where I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I think once you've established a reputation, um, that's not so much the issue. But I just think 
the older I get, the more I am motivated by trying to achieve some sort of a, you know, or more equality. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, when I was a little kid, I was told that equality was there, but it clearly isn't. Um, you know, there are very, very, very few um, on air females um, and there are even less behind the scenes. Mm. Um, and that's not because girls don't like sports. So we need to take a look and go, okay, why is this happening? Um, how do we change it? Uh, do we, you know, as bosses, do we need to be making different decisions? Do we need to be being more proactive about this? Um, and I think that's really important. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely, like I say, the older I get, the more I'm motivated by, by, okay, hang on. When I was born 35 years ago, we were told this was happening. Now I'm about to turn 35 and I go, eh, we're still really not there. Or even yeah, there. that's a great message, um, Nez. And, and look, it's always something that struck me me about you as well like you always come across as a you've uh, you know you've got these strong values you know you're full of integrity and 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 a lot of respect how um and and taking that stand and that's something Ruzi's taught that like that was something that he taught me in terms about leadership that's that's a part of leadership and you know knowing and doing something that you know is right how did you and and this is I want to talk to you about the Chris Gale and the Mark Robinson incident How, how how hard was it for you to speak up, you know, in terms of when you saw those incidents happen or, or you were a part of them, how, did, how hard was it for you to speak up? To, to not, sorry. Did, uh, was there comments about Aaron Phillips? Oh, oh, yeah, no, I know what you're talking about with the yeah. um, kiss at the brown line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and look, and that goes back to what you're saying in terms of the male dominated industry. And we're not at that equality level, like you just said, like, how hard was it to, for you as a personality to speak up in an industry like that where, you know, there's so many males around that would a lot of them and, you know, we're, we're both the same age, a lot of them in that older category would think, oh, that's fine to say something like that, you know, like where we, where we know it's not. It's, it is hard. And so I'm, I'm studying a mental health and counselling course at the moment just to, you know, fill in some time in, in this and, mm. you know, so much of it is, is um, the importance of belonging and, um, you know, social inclusion and diversity and on all of those sorts of things. And you kind of just want to hand it over to, to everyone in industry and go read this. Exactly. Um, but it's, it's definitely hard. And I think um, when you stick your neck out to do, cause as you say, doing the right thing is not only, um, Often not. It is not often the easy thing. No, it's never um, often popular either, is it? Yeah, and, and a lot of the time, only time tells that you did the right thing. Mm. And that is a really hard thing to do and it's why I haven't stuck my neck out that many times and why a lot of people don't. I think we've seen something, you know, recently for example, um, with Indigenous Australia and particularly within footy, there has been more Indigenous Australians and players coming out in the last few months and being pretty honest and and vulnerable and upfront about it, whether it's, you know, Eddie Betts or Chad Wingard or or even, you know, Nikki Winmar speaking more about it. And I think because we've, we've, as a society, allowed a platform to have those discussions, which has only come about because of the death of a black man in America. Mm. So I think that disconnect um, has actually allowed us to be more vulnerable because um, white Australia doesn't feel necessarily um, like they're to blame for this particular incident. And therefore it allowed the walls to come down a little bit to have the conversation. Um, The way that I sort of describe it is it's almost a bit like group therapy. If somebody else starts, you're sort of, um, it's like this global group therapy, right? Yeah. Something yeah. happened in the US, the rest of us are looking within ourselves to see what we can do. Mm. Um, that's, that's what happens when an incident happens, is it allows you the platform to speak up and speak honestly with less fear of judgment rather than just sticking your neck out arbitrarily and saying, this is what happens, um, I'd like you to believe me. People will often get defensive if you do that. Mm. So that's why people take the opportunity in those sort of moments to try and say, look, you want to know what it's like for us? I'll be honest. But there's very few opportunities that I've had in my career to actually do that where people genuinely ask you, what is it like for you? And secondly, that you feel like you can actually honest, honestly answer. 
mm. without fear of reprisal or, you know, or backlash, whether it's social media or within the industry. Um, yeah. And I think it's a long, it's a long time away until people, um, you know, whoever it is that's been marginalised, whether it's women or Indigenous Australia, you know, we're still a long way away from people to be able to speak freely all the time. Do you ever think we'll get there, Ned? Or do you think it's uh, like a constant improvement that, that the nation needs to continue to go through or the sporting industry itself? I think, I think the latter. Um, I hope we, we get there one day. I would love to be able to be in a position where things don't happen and or if they do happen, everyone is aware of it. There's so many things you know, with, um, with women, I, and I've spoken about it before, like just things like access to toilets. I mean, and it's often the most basic things that give you an indicator of what it's like day to day. Um, so most of my career, I love my career. I'm not, you know, complaining. I'm not saying it's the worst thing in the world to be a woman, but there are still a lot of things that, that the blokes in the industry just wouldn't even know. Yeah. Um, and, and I think also when you're in it, you kind of just keep going. You don't, you try and even yourself not to highlight it or notice it because what's mm. the point really? Yeah. No. Um, I hope that it gets better. You know, I've got an eight and a half year old niece who this year on her eighth birthday, I organised for her to run out and be the mascot for the first ever AFLW. Um, oh, really? Derby. So, you know, she looks up and sees Cara Antonio, um, you know, who's married to a teammate, that's that's legal in 2020 as well, yeah. which is amazing and should have been legal bloody well before that. But, you know, this is a little girl who gets to look up at her hero, run out with the team um, in front of a big stadium with lots of people. And so that, you know, you compare that little set of context compared to when we were kids. Yeah. I was the only girl in the soccer team, let alone footy team. Um, yeah, right. you know, changed enormously yeah and that's one of the biggest things that i've noticed or well, certainly when i was watching aflw that was probably one of the biggest smiles that got that was put on my face was seeing all those young girls in the crowd and their eyes light up and i know they do it at, a, at an AF, men's afl match as well but to see so many girls in the crowd and being like it, it was it was a great sort of um image for me to see all these girls feeling so inspired and look so excited and and looking up to these female athletes who are, who are doing amazing things on, on the footy field. It was just, yeah, it was great to see. But do you know what I think is even or as important as that is all the little boys at the AFLW looking up and seeing their heroes. Yeah. And that, that's the thing for me is I take my niece once again and I often use her as an example. She's got three little brothers. All three of those little brothers play Auskick because their cool big sister plays it and their auntie's on TV talking about it. Yeah. So their life in an instant has completely changed. Yeah. So, you know, women play footy and it's as simple as that their perspective from an early age it got an yeah yeah what a great yeah and if if we change the male perspective as well that's where change really happens so it's not about telling every little girl or every big girl you can it's um it's telling them that and the boy is believing it Mm, yeah no great message nez nez um what's um what's on the agenda for you now what's what's the next sort of i know sort of still in lockdown down there in melbourne but what's what's the next uh sort of six months 12 months look like um does anyone know what the next six to 12 months <laughs> oh, no, it's a, that's a hard question <laughs> i know podcast get released <laughs> yeah, exactly a few weeks now <laughs> um yeah, I I am actually off to the IPL. Oh, okay, fantastic. Over in okay. India. Yeah, it's well, it's happening in the UAE. So, oh, so yeah, of course, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So I was due to be doing that um, at the start of this year, and then obviously um, Rona came along. So yeah, um, yeah, I'm off off to do the IPL with Star. So that'll be yeah, it'll be oh, nice to get out of my apartment. Yeah, I could imagine. Oh, I could imagine. I feel, still feel so sorry for everyone in Melbourne at the moment. Um, there's a final couple of questions. Um, three life lessons or pieces of advice that you'd pass on to anyone wanting to follow their dreams. So three lessons that you've had in life that you want to pass um, on. Don't, don't ever give up who you are to achieve a goal. Um, and that goes hand in hand with, you know, what's doing right isn't always what's, what's easy yeah um you know believe in yourself really Mm. um and and listen and educate yourself on on what life is like for others um listen to understand instead of to respond 
Yeah, no, love it. Nez, I just want to acknowledge you. Um, thanks so much for being on us today, jumping on the show, having a chat to me, and, and also just being um, an amazing person. It's, it's, I suppose it's during these times that everyone... I'll just cut up all your, your bits here for all the compliments. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send them all out to you. I'll, cut them, I'll get my brother to do it and cut it <laughs> Um, you've had a great, you know, you've had a really incredible career in the, in the media. You've got some great things happening now, as you say, you head over to IPL. So, um, yeah, I just want to wish you all the best for that year ahead. And, and it's really has been such a pleasure having you on. So thanks so much, Nez. Thanks for having me. No, that's okay. Quickly, where can people find you, social media and your, give your, um, podcast the plug as well. So podcast, ordinarily speaking, um, is available on all normal um, forums. Uh, also has an Instagram page at, undersc- at ordinarily underscore speaking. I'll put it in the notes, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Instagram at Nez M and Twitter at narrowly underscore Meadows. Amazing. Final question. Yep. What's the definition of success? Success is not letting fear of failure get in the way of of what you're trying to achieve for yourself in your little corner of the world. Amazing. Thanks so much, Niz. I really, really appreciate it. You're a legend. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. There you go, guys. What an amazing insight from the lovely and down-to-earth Aussie sports TV presenter, Narrowly Meadows. I just love Niz's take on the power of vulnerability, her courage to chase her dream from such a young age, and also for her inspiring outlook on equality in sport. It really was such an enjoyable chat and I hope you took something away from it as well. And just a reminder guys, if you enjoyed this episode today, please share it with your friends, tag me on Instagram and subscribe to Apple iTunes and Spotify accounts so you don't miss an episode. Until next time, you guys know what to do. Get out there, face those fears and live those dreams. You'll be okay.